in the SEC versus Ripple case, Ripple has slammed the SEC and their most recent opposition to the iRemit and TapJet's motions to file amicus briefs going after the SEC for their inability to have a sustainable case here and for their opposition against parties who do have a legitimate interest in the outcome of this case and Empower Oversight, who we followed here for over a year now, has exposed the SEC's bad faith tactics in their crypto conflicts lawsuit filing and has a new press release from earlier today talking more about the details around that. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. All right, let's jump right into the SEC versus Ripple case. Here we have courtesy of James K. Filan, the most recent filing by Ripple. It's only about a page and a half. We'll go through it quickly here. This is their rebuttal to the SEC's opposition to the motions to file amicus briefs by iRemit and TapJet. So there's some pretty fiery responses in here. I think you'll like this one. So from the Ripple side, Dear Judge Torres, Defendants, Ripple, Garlinghouse, and Larson respectfully submit this letter in response to the motions for leave to file amicus curiae briefs by iRemit and TapJets and the SEC's response thereto. The SEC mischaracterizes both the briefs and the law when it claims that the proffered amicus briefs of iRemit and TapJets constitute improper attempts by movements to offer evidence outside the constraints of discovery restrictions, the rules of evidence, and this court's prior order. iRemit and TapJets are independent third parties otherwise unconnected with this litigation. They seek permission to file briefs to offer the court their important perspective on whether industry participants invested in XRP, whether they expected profits from defendants' efforts, and how the SEC's theory of this case, if adopted by the court, would adversely impact their businesses. They provide the court with information concerning their business operations and industries to support their perspectives. There is nothing wrong with that. Indeed, the main purpose of amicus briefs is not to repeat legal arguments made by the parties, but to provide the court with a broader industry perspective. And there's a case cited here. And it's not just one, but multiple. And they say here, from the case authority, finding no authority for the broad proposition that an amici cannot present evidence because they are not formal parties to the litigation and permitting brief or permitting amicus briefs to present factual material at summary judgment. So you can see those references if you'd like in the video description. Now continuing the letter here, they say the SEC cites only two cases in support of its opposition, both of which are in opposite. In Strasser versus Dorley, the First Circuit, questioning the wisdom of the court proactively inviting the participation of a particular amici, held that where a district court lacks joint consent of the parties, only an amicus with a special interest may file briefs. This is not the rule in the Second Circuit, where the usual rationale for amicus curiae submissions is that they are of aid to the court and offer insights not available from the parties. And more case citations. Finally, the SEC remarkably suggests that it would be prejudiced by its inability to evaluate the factual veracity of their claims or show that Movin's facts or movements facts are disputed. The SEC has sought summary judgment based on what it erroneously claims are undisputed facts that every purchase of XRP is an investment and that every XRP purchaser expects profits from Ripple's efforts. Nothing could be more to the point than these two amicus briefs refuting or at least disputing both points. And here's the punchline. If the SEC cannot evaluate the veracity of such claims, then it had no business bringing this litigation in the first place. A fiery response here, signed off by Michael Kellogg, who is the attorney for Larson in particular, and then you have Ripple, or sorry, he's on the uh, Ripple side, and then you have uh, Garlinghouse 
and Larson here on the side. Nothing from Solomon here, but Kellogg uh, hitting the SEC pretty hard. So check out the document in the comments, or in the video description rather, and let me know what you think in the comments about what was said here. I think this is a pretty good response. And again, I'll be up to Judge Torres, but uh, they do certainly have some insights that wouldn't otherwise be available to the court, so it should be allowed. Uh, and having more facts, more uh, statements from businesses and how they operate certainly would not harm the case. More information, especially in, in this format, should prove to be beneficial if you are having a faithful allegiance to the law. Now, the SEC has been or told by Judge Netburn that that's not how they're acting, so uh, time will tell how this one plays out. Now, speaking of a lack of faithful allegiance to law or ethics or anything else, Empower Oversight has exposed the SEC's bad faith Freedom of Information Act tactics in their crypto conflicts lawsuit filing. So this press release was released earlier today. Let's take a dive through it. It's a short one. If you recall, Empower Oversight is trying to get information regarding Hinman, Berger, and Clayton, and some of the potential conflicts of interest uh, that were happening between them and the other parties when they left the SEC to join these various firms. So that they already had ties to, mind you, before they even left. So let's run through it. It's a short one. Empower Oversight filed its opposition to the SEC's motion for summary judgment in the ongoing Freedom of Information Act lawsuit over documents related to the conflicts of interest and selective enforcement in crypto cases. The filing demonstrates the SEC uh, intentionally misinterpreted the plain text of Empower Oversight's request, admittedly ignored statutory deadlines without cause, and solicited search terms to locate documents only to ignore those as well. Uh, Jason Foster, the founder and president of Empower Oversight, issued the following statement. It's abundantly clear, he says, that the SEC is doing everything within its power to hide information from the public about these issues. The key question is why, despite its stubborn delays and resistance to our FOIA requests, the few documents that we managed to pry loose from the agency point to serious ethical concerns. Perhaps it is merely bureaucratic incompetence, but it is also possible that the SEC is acting like it has nothing to hide because it actually has something to hide. That's why the Freedom of Information Act exists. Uh, or sorry, I, I misread that. It's possible the SEC is acting like it has something to hide because it actually has something to hide. So they say that's why the Freedom of Information Act exists, to hold government accountable through transparency. The law requires more than the SEC seems willing to provide. They continue here. In May of this year, Empower Oversight sent a referral to the SEC Inspector General based on documents that raise questions about the failure of the SEC and its ethics office to properly manage SEC official Bill Hinman's conflicts of interest regarding crypto issues, contacts with his former law firm, Simpson Thatcher, and that firm's interest in promoting one crypto, Ethereum, over others. Since then, more emails have come to light, not referenced in the referral, raising new questions about his contacts with partners at his former firm, including a contact with Simpson Thatcher partner Chris Lin to report on what's going on in China around the time a Chinese client had business before the SEC. From the outset, the SEC has resisted complying with its legal disclosure obligations. As Empower explained in its court filing this week, the SEC admittedly failed to provide a Freedom of Information Act uh, determination within the time required by law without citing any reason it could not meet the deadline. The SEC began complying only after Empower Oversight filed its lawsuit. Empower was harmed by the SEC's delay because it had to expend resources, including filing fees and attorney's fees, to enforce its statutory right to information. Empower Oversight is asking the court to declare that the SEC violated the statute and allow Empower to recover its costs under the law, which is designed to reward plaintiffs whose filing of lawsuits alters the government's slowness and brings about disclosure. In its August of 2021, so over a year ago, this Freedom of Information Act request that kicked all of this off, Empower Oversight sought all records 
relating to communications between certain SEC officials and any personnel from certain outside entities, including emails between those officials and email addresses at specific domain names associated with those entities. But Empower did not limit the scope to only include those names. This request was designed to obtain all records of communications between SEC officials like Hinman and people at outside entities or entities like his law firm, Simpson Thatcher, regardless of how the communications occurred or whether they passed through, through Simpson Thatcher's official email domain. Empower points to a conference call with SEC FOIA staff in January of this year and the SEC's refusal to conduct searches using the terms it asked for during that call as evidence of the agency's unreasonably feeble search efforts and bad faith. And Power learned on that call that the SEC had only searched for emails from three specified domain names, even though the request was not limited to those. During that call, the SEC claimed it could not search more broadly because FOIA staff could not know the names of every individual associated with each of the parties in the request and asked Empower to provide a specific list of names for the agency to search. Thus, the parties agreed that Empower would provide a list. The SEC claimed in its motion for summary judgment that it didn't have to comply with the request so broad that it would impose an unreasonable burden on the agency. And yet, when the SEC sought to limit the scope of the search, Empower agreed. In response to this good faith effort to accommodate the SEC's concern about an overly broad search, the SEC then refused to conduct the narrowed search. As Empower explained in the court filing, the SEC sought to narrow its search by soliciting a list of names to define any personnel, more specifically, and Empower obliged. The agency failed to use the list of names it solicited from Empower to conduct searches. In short, the SEC acted unreasonably and in bad faith by asking Empower to provide the list of names, which it promptly provided, and the SEC promptly ignored. Empower initially filed the lawsuit in December of 2020, or sorry, 2021, after months of delay by the SEC in response to that August request. A month later, Empower appealed the SEC's initial false claim that it had no records related to portions of the request. In January 2022, Empower submitted a second FOIA request seeking all records related to the SEC's processing of the first request, which yielded documents cited and attached as exhibits in this week's court filing about the SEC's inadequate searches. In February, Empower provided the SEC with the list of names it requested on a conference call to narrow the scope of its search. Jason Foster also published an article detailing why we need more transparency in the crypto realm, and we previously looked at that here on the channel. So, as you can see, the SEC is continuing to dodge Empower Oversight. We already knew about this, so, so it's not a surprise. The SEC has also not responded and has sought to have their motion for summary judgment in this case in order to not have to uh, further reply to Empower Oversight's requests. So, there's still a lot going on here. Hopefully we get some more answers, but if nothing else, there has been some fruit from this in that we saw some of those things pertaining to the Hinman uh, communications with parties external to the SEC, and that's opened the door for other people to file things and get uh, items like the Hinman calendar made public, which we just saw and looked at last week. So a lot of good things have come from this. Even if we get nothing else, it certainly has been beneficial and has helped in the pursuit of this case. Now, in closing here, just one thing to point out that I did want to uh, remind you of. I put it in the comments, but uh, until Sunday, there's 15% off everything in the merch store if you're interested in an XRP Army, uh, X-Men, Win Lambo, or any other product there. So 15% off through the end of the week. I hope the information here in the video was helpful for you. Uh, we've got a lot going on between what's been happening with the back and forth on iRemit and Tabjets. Uh, we've seen a lot of conversation around it in the last week. And then with Empower Oversight having had this out there for over a year, we're seeing this sort of come to its close and hopefully we see some resolution between that 
the SEC versus Ripple case and the SEC versus Library case so we can get some of these things uh, finished off and move on and have more clarity for the industry moving forward. So if you found any value here, drop a like. It helps the channel a ton and helps me to keep you informed. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already so I can keep you up to date on all of the latest news and updates. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. I do appreciate it. Have a great night. I'll see you in the next one.